Front of the bottle, quad turn back, check your bail out. With Nigel wielding his chainsaw, Connie and I are staying out of the water, watching proceedings in the archaeology unit's dive trailer. Nigel's rig has a camera on the helmet, so we should be able to see what he's doing. Step up. First, Nigel is going to check conditions are safe enough to use his underwater chainsaw. He's following the line left by Connie that will lead him straight to the timber. Okay, well, if you can just get up close and personal with the timber. Yeah, I'm happy with you sampling the timber. With all checks in place for this dangerous procedure, the chainsaw is lowered to Nigel on the seabed. For safety reasons, the saw is powered from a generator on the surface, and Nigel will signal that he wants the power turned on or off with orders of hot and cold. Okay, stand by, we're gonna get ready to make it hot. Hot! Okay, you're hot. Getting cut. No. Now, from what you could see on there, are you happy about where he was cutting, what he was cutting? Yeah, I am because they excavated down to where they could see the different. Uh, break in the timbers between right. the top and the lower one, so yeah. And it'll take a while, it's oak. Make it cold. Make it cold! 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 Okay, you're cold. Okay, uh, we have a sample. Yay! Okay, Get then mad. have a nice gun. All stop there, all stop there, diver. Big piece. Yeah, it's huge. Okay, Diver, that's grand, that's grand. Uh, Can I have one of these chains on for Christmas, please? Lovely call. Yeah, copy that one. <laughs> well, make sure there's one in your sack. Uh, good point. Triumphantly, Nigel delivers his impressive sample to the surface. Thank you so much. That is a huge chunk of wood. Great tool. Well done. Isn't that excellent. Really, excellent. really, really good. Yeah. Well, look at that. Are you happy absolutely with it? Yeah, I'm very superb. happy with that. And Ooh. it stinks, doesn't it? It absolutely stinks. Uh, <laughs> but that's always a lovely smell. That smell means you've got wonderful anaerobic conditions, great preservation of You're an organic old man. materials. Yeah, You're I guess very I, old I'm man, slightly odd, yes. but I mean, <laughs> I think that's a pretty good result. It is great, isn't it? And Were you fairly happy down there? Oh, very happy, you know. I could have stayed down there for another couple of hours, but I needed a cup of tea. So just <laughs> preliminarily, do you think it will be a good sample? We need a, a minimum of 50 rings. Now, that's right. quite fast grown, but it's a pretty large sample, yeah. so uh, I think we might get enough rings in it. Yeah. Uh, whether we get a date or not, it's tricky. That's a very difficult thing to say. Yeah. We await a result with bated breath. Good, good. <laughs> Nigel now has to go back to his lab to analyse his precious sample, and he's keen to get going immediately. Getting an accurate date will depend on the number of tree rings he finds.
Records from this period are scarce, and it's proving hard to find out any details of what kind of ship the Great Lewis was. But my searches have finally borne fruit. I've come across an actual reference to the Great Lewis, a contract from February 1644, less than a year before she sank. This tells us she was a merchant ship of 400 tons, hired by the Parliamentarian Navy for the guard of the coast of Ireland. In the mid-1640s, the parliamentarians were desperate to boost their influence at sea and hired in substantial merchant ships to build up a navy. Extra sailors were recruited and more cannon fitted to prepare these vessels for their new role as warships. The discovery that the Great Lewis was a 400-ton merchant ship gives us a significant new lead. Now we know her weight and likely design, we can check if these details tally with the wreck. But with much of it blanketed in silt, our best chance lies with timbers previously raised from the site. These timbers, brought up during past dredging, alerted archaeologists to the wreck. We've been given permission to take samples from them for dating analysis. But first, I'm keen to see if we can get any clues linking them to a merchant ship of 400 tonnes. I've brought our ship's construction expert, Richard Enzer, to have a look. The timbers are preserved by Dr Neil Brady, who first located the wreck. So you were part of the team, Neil, that actually found the wreck. It was the 8th of January 2002 that we actually found the wreck, and that was a moment of great excitement. You found it by diving? Yes. Right. And what did you diving. see on that first, on that first occasion? Uh, timbers. Right. Timbers. Lots of timbers. It was, Fantastic. It, it was one of those great mm. moments. Mm. Uh, now, from what we've learned from the archives, Richard, we know that this merchantman was about 400 tonnes. Uh, does that give you any sense of what, you should, what we should be looking for in the timbers that we've got here? Um, yes, it does. We, we know the size of the timbers that you'd expect to find on a ship of about 400 tonnes. This ship, this merchantman, is, is quite likely to be a collier. They would have been more square-shaped than, than the Navy-built ships, which were obviously built for speed as well as firepower. Uh, the English Navy, we know, um, hired a lot of these colliers at this time. They were good, substantially built ships, and they took normally coals from Newcastle all the way down to London. Now, there was something over here, wasn't there, Richard, that yes. I saw you casting your eye at interestedly. Yes, these, these two pieces of timber here. Do you um, want to hand out them, are they? I think this is probably a part of the external planking. Good. Another piece which is of interest is this one. These fixings are the same sort of fixings right. that were held through these. So these are good examples of a piece of framing and a piece of the outside planking. Now I get the impression there's something quite substantial in this tank. That's correct. This is perhaps the largest timber that has come up again through dredging. And there we go. Okay. Wow. That is a piece, isn't it? Yes. It's very difficult to be precise, but it looks about the width of what, you know, 12, 13 inches, mm -hmm. about the size of the keel. And you're happy that this would be consistent with the ship of the uh, sort of tonnage that, yes, we, that yes, we think the Great Lewis was? Of about 400 tonnes. Mm -hmm. We can't say definitively, yes, from this evidence, this is the Great Lewis, but certainly everything we have here um, fits with the, mm -hmm. with, with the description of it. It's another piece of the jigsaw. The timbers raised from the wreck site are the right size and shape for the Great Lewis, matching what we've learnt of her from the archives. Nigel takes a range of samples from the timbers to help with his dating. He'll analyse these samples alongside the one he took from the wreck itself. Dendrochronology is the study of tree ring patterns, each ring representing a year of growth. The thickness of each ring is dependent on the weather when the tree was growing. A recognisable pattern can lead to a date reading. Mm -hmm. 
Nigel examines a range of samples from the wreck and the dredge timbers, and finally comes up with the date of 1555. Although this is 90 years before the Great Lewis's sinking, the date range still fits. In the shipbuilder's yard, the timber would have been shaped, removing tree rings from the outer layers. Accounting for this would place our timbers in the late 1500s. Adding the likely length of service of the ship brings us into the 17th century and again puts our wreck in the right era for the Great Lewis. We're making progress at last. But as time runs out, will we get a chance to see more of the wreck? And could it yield up the vital clue that will prove it is the Great Lewis? Coming up. We've got a container ship coming, no scuba for 10 minutes. We have a close encounter with passing shipping. And. Okay, Miranda, did you say 28 inches? We finally get to grips with a cannon. It's our last chance to dive a wreck we're hoping to identify as the Great Lewis, which sank in 1645. While we've been off the boat, Connie and the archaeology unit have completed their post-dredge assessment, and senior archaeologist Finn Barmore has located one of the wreck's cannon. At last, we will finally get a chance to look at one of the six cannon on the wreck site. Connie is hoping the newly exposed gun is what they call Cannon 1, the unit's main orientation point on the site. She's previously taken measurements of the cannon down there, and gunnery expert Charles Trollope checks through these to narrow down his 17th century date range. To confirm his verdict, he wants Miranda to take a couple of additional measurements under his supervision. Having moored up, conditions are good to dive, and as Finbar makes his way to the cannon, I get a briefing from Connie and Charles. If you can get me a measurement, round just in front of the base ring on the gun. Halfway will do with the tape. OK? Right. And do we have any idea what the visibility is like down there? It's improving because there's a bit yeah, of a run yeah, picking yeah, up. Yeah. yeah, I've noticed the current was just starting to go now, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you should be yeah. able to see yeah. it. You will be able to see mm. it. I will be able to. <laughs> if you can find it down there with your fingertips, just take the end down and yep. tickle it and read the other one. OK, shall I take that then? Yep. Marvellous. There you are. I'll, I'll see you in a bit. See me in a bit, yes. Enjoy yourself. Thank I'm not you coming. <laughs> I can't wait to have a look at the cannon. I'll be using my compass to measure the direction it's pointing in. This will allow Connie to confirm if it's Cannon 1. Dan, Miranda's coming in now. There's a container ship coming down in about 10 minutes. I want all scuba divers out of the water. Roger, we've got a container ship coming. No scuba for 10 minutes. We've got no choice but to wait for this huge ship to pass by. It's eating into valuable dive time. But it would be far too dangerous to dive near shipping like this, which creates strong turbulence under the water. Finally, it's safe to dive. Ready? Uh, go! Connie, Charles and I are poised to note down any measurements Miranda takes. When you're ready, to the right. Making my way down to the site, I realise the measuring won't be easy, as visibility is again appalling. Luckily, Finbar is there to guide me around the cannon. I'm moving along towards the Cascabel then. You, you see the Cascabel? Uh, the, the oh, wow! Okay, and you see where it goes at an angle into the seabed, down where all the ropes are. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Can you carry on? Yes, please, carry on. I can just feel the Cascabel. 
<laughs> the theory looks so simple. It's actually uh, put the practice of being down there is yeah. a hard one. In that stuff. Okay, right. I'm, I'm confident now that I've got my arm about halfway round the ring. My measurement is what's that? 28. She's saying the half the circumference fine. is 28 inches. Yeah, that'll do fine. Yeah, Miranda. Yeah. That's good. 28 inches is good. Good. Yeah, good. You're just getting the um, orientation. Oh yeah, the orientation. Getting the okay. orientation now. It may tie up the cannon number one. The compass bearing should also allow Connie to assess whether the cannon has been affected by the recent dredging. Fifty-five degrees. Okay. Thanks for that. They're obviously having an awful time down there, so I think probably that's the only yes. useful bit of information. That's the useful get bit we will get from that one, I think. Yes. yes. So yeah, um, if you want to leave bottom, Miranda. Okay. Dan's on the surface. He's on the surface. Right. Let's get Miranda out first. All right. Coming out. Oh. That was really good. You going down and joining Finbar down there, and, and, and him uncovering the cannon, and you getting the measurements. At least now we can kind of tie it in and feel confident that it's cannon number one. So that's definitely cannon that's number one. It is. Yeah. We we know it's in situ where it's supposed to be. And yeah, how yeah, useful was that measurement? Well, that's all right. We can good. work from that yeah. because I actually saw you take it. I didn't know from your measurements exactly where you take it, but I saw her take it. Yeah, yeah. I saw it. So I know exactly where that one was. The two together agreed an answer. Then you and know so you can get what you've a got. Data so gun what you got? What you got? What you got? No, it does tell us what we what we're doing. I mean, the more we see of these guns, the more I'm certain they are of this date. We know it's not earlier than about 1636, and we know it's not later than the 1670s. So this is in keeping? This it's is in, in keeping, keeping oh, with yes. the 1640s oh, yes. ship? This yes. is in keeping even potentially with, with the Great Lewis? Oh, yes. Mm. Good. Yeah, potentially, yes. Mm. And with that, our investigations have come to an end. The dates Charles has just given us are highly significant, putting us right in the middle of the 17th century. With no other ship known to have sunk in Waterford Harbour within 50 years of 1645, our wreck is perfectly in keeping with the great Lewis. I think it's been a really good week. It, it's added to our information um, hugely on the wreck site, and it's brought us closer to identifying it. And uh, I mean, it, the date range is consistent with a wreck like the Great Lewis. So piece by piece, we're putting this jigsaw together, and the evidence seems to be pointing it to it being the Great Lewis. Um, unless it's another wreck that we have no record for, it's pointing very much to the, a high potential that it is mm. the Great Lewis. Mm. So we've been following your post-dredging assessment, and so far you think the site is safe. But what is the future for this site now? Well, the site appears to be safe and in situ and untouched by the dredgings in, in so much as it hasn't been disturbed. It's obviously of huge significance, national significance, yeah. so, yeah, it's our job is to protect it. We've spent the week diving in terrible visibility. And yet it hasn't stopped the archaeology unit doing their valuable work to protect and monitor such a historically important wreck. The sinking of the Great Lewis severely disrupted the parliamentarian supply lines. And two months later, they surrendered Duncannon Fort to the Irish Confederates. This was a major blow to the parliamentarian cause in its Irish theatre of war. There's now a strong sense that we're closing in on our wreck's identity. Certainly size and age of both timbers and cannon, plus the wreck's location fit our prime candidate perfectly. With ongoing investigations, the archaeologists may soon be able to confirm the Duncannon wreck as the Great Lewis. Well, you can explore more of the hidden world of marine archaeology at channel4.com slash science. Next today, skimming stones on a big scale as new scrap heap challenge continues. <laughs> <laughs>